No, I mean, but Max, you know that it's a monkey paw situation where you're like, I wish men's fashion would advance. And then the first time it's going to advance, it's going to be like cod pieces, but in a stupid way, in a way that you're not going to like, where you're like, you know, cod pieces might be a fun thing to to make like a major men's fashion thing, but then it's going to advance and you're going to hate it. I don't know. Well, you know what? Be the change you want to see in the world. If you want to see men wearing more cod pieces... I think I'm just thinking of like we those, all have to work together to start to normalize this. That I'm thinking like you could get really creative if like cod pieces were a thing. You could like get super wild with that. Like those uh Japanese like uh tenbu masks with like the long red <laughs> nose. Oh my god. <laughs> You're the, talking about a tengu cod piece? Yeah. Get that? That would be fucking amazing. <laughs> Yep, and then you'll get, you know, this will feed into our media cycle where lots of people write articles about how, how your cultural appropriation of the Tengu mask for your cod piece. Yeah. Uh, it's all, it's all you know what, it sounds perfect, Max. All press is good press, man. Yeah. But you know another cod piece that would be really exciting to have would be what if your cod piece was just a fucking gun? That You know what? That's true. That's 100% true. That That would probably be the best possible cod piece you could have. If only there was a film where we could see that in action. Well, Max, there is. It's called what? From Dusk Till Dawn, and we're watching it today. Oh, my God. On the Spectator Film Podcast. Hello, everyone. I'm Max. And I'm Austin. And yeah, we're doing From Dusk Till Dawn today. I should have known this because it was my pick. Yes. But with the, our favorite cod piece so far in cinema. Yes. Um, I, oh, I don't know. We've done Labyrinth on the show, and David Bowie's cod piece is That's pretty- not his cod piece. That's just his cock, though. Yeah, I mean, he has a cod piece on, but it didn't serve its intended purpose. Yeah, so technically it's a less effective, you know, cod piece. We're really the thing with uh, Tom Savini, uh, Sex Machine, sorry, yes. his character's name. We'll call him by his character's name. Uh, his his cod piece in this is just a gun, and it, it is, is very incredibly effective. useful. Yeah, It serves its intended purpose. In fact, almost immediately, it winds up being useful. So, uh, yeah, I, I think this is a far more effective cod piece. Yes. But uh, is that the reason you chose this movie? Uh, no. I actually forgot about Tom <laughs> Savini being in this movie. Until oh, that's kind of a nice surprise. It was. I'm yeah. just like, oh, yeah, that's uh, it's Tom Savini. He has a gun for a dick. That's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Robert Rodriguez likes doing that. He likes replacing uh, people's organs or limbs with guns. He, we see that revisited later in Planet Terror. Yes. Um, I still... I, We'll get into yeah, his other works later. But I chose this specifically because I wanted to do a Robert Rodriguez movie. And I remember thinking, like, I hadn't watched this movie in six or seven years before I chose to do it. And in the pantheon of my mind, this was up there for one of his best movies. Right. I was like, okay, yeah. Well, we've done a lot of horror on the show. We've been doing a bit more action recently. This is a fun melding of the two. We get a little bit of Quentin Tarantino's writing and his acting. We get Robert Rodriguez's directorial style and some wild flourishes with special effects and horror. It's great. And then I rewatched the movie. It's not as good as I remember. I think rather than blend together, Tarantino's writing and acting kind of clash with Rodriguez's directorial style. And while I do appreciate the snap finger genre twist that happens in the middle of the movie, I don't think the movie as a whole is particularly great. I think the second half and the first half might as well be different movies um, in just terms of tone and pacing and characters. But I still think it's kind of a must see if you're a horror or horror comedy fan. It's one of those movies that you you should experience, even if rewatching it, I do not hold it as one of Robert Rodriguez's best movies anymore. Yeah, and uh, I know that Robert Rodriguez has been on our radar for a while now. We we do like him here. At yeah, the Film Podcast. I was expecting us to do Spy Kids as his first movie, um, so I was a little surprised by uh, this pick. Um, I, upon rewatching this, which also I haven't seen this in quite a while. I, I can't remember the last time I saw this, but um, yeah, I I also sort of agree that this movie doesn't. It feels kind of lackluster now. There's some good things about it. I like some of the performances. Um, some of the writing is okay, but to me, the, the writing has mostly aged poorly and seems kind of irritating. <laughs> um, I guess the vibe I get from this movie more than anything else is that it kind of feels like a fan movie or a, a student movie. And, uh, within that framework, I think it's pretty good. 
But uh, outside of that, and in terms of how much I just like enjoy it, it's like, yeah, I'll I'll pass or whatever. I like a lot of Robert Rodriguez's other movies, and uh, this one just doesn't work quite as well for me because you know what? It it's too influenced by that shallow '90s version of Tarantino um, with the stupid idea of like coolness and everything. And also, uh, you know, it's just a movie that I think is too reverent towards its source material. Um, and th- and they would team up again for the you know the, their grindhouse shit, which um, I think. The thing about Grindhouse, though, is Tarantino's contribution to that is arguably his worst movie he's ever made. And I love Planet Terror. I really do. Planet Terror is good, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, obviously that's the material they're drawing from. But I think in this movie it's entirely too uh, sort of faithful and reverent to that sort of thing. Um, And instead of actually participating in that type of exploitation, it comes off as like again, a fan movie, but also more specifically like a nerd movie. Like a movie I was constantly reminded of watching it this time around for the show was a movie like Baby Driver, where it's like, this movie's just trying to be the driver again, except done by Edgar Wright. And uh, I watched this movie and I mostly feel that it's made by someone who just has too many Funko Pops, um, which is stupid and, <laughs> and, and makes me roll my eyes. Like Quentin Tarantino, you may have Russ Meyer Funko Pops, but they are still just stupid pieces of uh, plastic. And uh, this movie is uh, a fan movie. <laughs> so Not uh, entirely bad, though. We're, we're coming down pretty hard on it. We do enjoy parts of this movie. Yeah, I just I understand its place in the culture, but I just think it's like slightly overrated. But there's a lot of really good things yes. about it. I just don't think it really comes together. Like how this movie splits down the middle in terms of yeah. genre. We're going to split down the middle in terms of going from bashing this movie to praising it. Yeah, so. and I mean, compared to a lot of other things, I'm I'm definitely going to be on the side of this movie. I think yeah. a lot of my critiques are going to be somewhat devil's advo- advocate stuff, but also just saying that, like, you know, there's a different way, like, you know, there's, there's a different way to approach making movies with this type of style material, specifically, like, exploitation-style movies, and doing it in this way doesn't really create that. It creates a more reverent kind of, like... Um, uh, fan servicey type of movie. So uh, yeah, that's that's kind of my take on the movie. I I don't entirely agree, but it'll be interesting to analyze that as we go on. But if you're ready to go, I say we cross the border into doing our commentary into Mexico. Yes. Yeah, let's uh, let's twist some titties. Let's get going. <laughs> Here we are, everyone. The movie has started, and I am already too drunk for this. I, I don't think we're drunk enough for this, honestly. We need to keep up with good old George Clooney as soon as he starts doing the ADT Gila shots. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. Well, all right, so we won't drink until then, just to keep our wits about us. Um, because, you know, our listeners need our very insightful and intelligent and sensitive commentary on the movie. 100%. Which will include many titty twister jokes, I'm sure. Um, so this movie, like, it starts off very Quentin Tarantino. Very much. And it, it kind of devolves from that later on. I would say this is the most explicitly post-Pulp Fiction scene. Mostly yes. because this scene matches the, well, I don't want to call it a framing device of Pulp Fiction, but, like, the whole robbery yes. thing, you know? Um and uh, I, I I think that very much like is a key part of something that I actually do like about this movie and the way it self-consciously is engaging with whatever this genre is, this 90s self-aware Tarantino crime movie type genre. I do like that it leans so heavily into that at the beginning, but it is going to run into problems, I think, almost immediately after this scene. Um. I, I actually think this opening scene is one of the best scenes in the movie, Max. No, I, w- I would agree. Which is, but also that's kind of disappointing for a movie where it's going to spin out of control and then become a vampire fiasco later, you know? <sighs> and I do love the vampire fiasco, yeah. but it's it's a very different film. Yeah, well, I, I think it just, it has to succeed in a different way and it doesn't quite set up enough things for it to be crazy enough in the end. But this opening scene is really tight on its own. Um. And I just, I don't know, I, I just think it's really well done. 
This actor, by the way, Michael Parks, he's a pretty cool actor. He he hasn't been in many very high profile movies outside of Quentin Tarantino stuff. He's he's one of Tarantino's guys. But uh, I want to make a recommendation for our viewers. He was in a seventies movie um, about J. Edgar Hoover that I think was directed by Larry Cohen, which is really quite good. And he, he plays RFK in that movie. By the way, Max, um, I don't know how familiar you are overall with Larry Cohen's filmography, but we got to do a Larry Cohen movie. I'd be down. Yeah. He, Larry Cohen, what a great filmmaker. Um, but but yeah, his uh, Jake or Hoover movie is pretty good. So that's a recommendation for all you guys. But we get the signature Tarantino dialogue of these characters, just profanity led and, and cheeky back and forths about ordinary things. Yeah, well, it's not, it's not really cheeky. Um, it is very much like... Just going back to what you said about like ordinary things, they're just talking about nothing, right? Yeah, which even more so than Tarantino seems to be a hallmark of the 90s in general, it's just talking about fucking nothing. Um, and then leading into the real plot, right? So they're just letting it cook and simmer. But I, I do think Michael Parks does pretty well with that type of like Quentin Tarantino dialogue where he really, he really downplays it in a way where he kind of like sucks the cool out of it. If that makes sense, it'd be very easy for uh, an actor to sort of play this up in a way where it's like they're they're ta- they're taking like what should be sort of a casual um, talking about nothing conversation and they turn it into an affectation, right? And then Michael Parks doesn't really do that. He just really he really plays it cool and sort of low key, and it makes it work in a way that I think is very important because it sells. The entire first half of this movie. You know what I'm saying? That's why this performance from Michael Parks is so important at the beginning, because it's like, if you buy this guy's performance, I think you're going to buy that this movie is not a vampire movie. Yes, and that's the interesting thing. I would say this scene carries the first half of the movie. Yeah. Because it does get a bit dull for the second part of the first half of the film. But because you know what these characters are capable of and you had this high octane scene so early on in the film, you're kind of waiting for something like that to happen again the entire time, which is good, but it doesn't necessarily pay off in a traditional sense, which I think is a weakness and a strength of this film where obviously you think it's going one way and it's going another. Oh, hello, George Clooney in one of his first major motion picture roles. Now, Max, let's not overlook Return of the Killer Tomatoes. Uh, true. Although I'm sure George Clooney would. Yeah, I, I do know that I, I couldn't find the specific interview and don't quote me on this, but I do remember reading an interview with him where he said this was one of his favorite movies to work on. He, he did have a blast filming this. I so. do think he's uh, quite good in it for a lot of reasons we'll discuss, but I think he handles that... Um, kind of a- affected Tarantino dialogue pretty well. Where I actually think he elevates it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to elaborate on this throughout the rest of the movie, but I think this is not one of Tarantino's best scripts. I think it's a fun idea. Um, I think you got the right actors. And I think the combination of the really good actors working together kind of helps to patch up some of the holes in the script um, or just some of the limitations of the script. But I think... This, this this script in general kind of just feels like a, a very early Tarantino rough draft, um, which in fairness, it kind of was when he wrote this because he wrote this at the beginning of the 90s. Or the other way you could look at it is it kind of feels like just a kind of inspired Tarantino ripoff. Um, but again, when you get those good actors, they can kind of really make it work. Um, and there's quite a few good actors in this movie, so I, I think they really string it together well. Yeah, and we, later on we'll get... Uh a lot of actors from Rodriguez's stable that show up and are wonderful. Yeah, I do kind of like the interplay between the Tarantino side of this and then the Rodriguez side of this in some ways. Uh, Sometimes it doesn't seem to work quite as well, you know, the clashing directorial style with the different dialogue and then sort of the different scheme for different scenes. Um, but clearly Rodriguez is a very talented director and I think he's able to um, bring a lot of his own twist to what could easily be a very overwhelming script from Tarantino because he's he very much like writes his style into the movie, you know? Like a Tarantino movie begins at the script level and you can tell it's a Tarantino movie. 
he's constantly stamping his name on every single part of it, you know? Yeah, well, we see that with him here. Um, I guess I should talk about what I think of Quentin Tarantino. Um, and you don't have to agree with me on this, obviously. Sure. But Tarantino's one of those directors kind of... The more I learn about him, the more like interviews with see I see with him. There are very few directors I dislike as much as a person, but respect <laughs> respect their work as much as Quentin Tarantino. He's just he's awful, annoying, a jerk, and but he's made very important and very good films. I don't think he's the best director of all time. I think he's made a lot of great movies that are important, but like his charms have started to wear thin on me. And when they're not, when he's not in complete control of a project like this movie, it's, it comes off a little more annoying than it might in a film of his own. It's like, um, what am I fucking, why am I blanking on his name? Fucking, uh, green inferno cabin fever. What's his name? Um, that director, Joe DiMaggio. No. Um. <laughs> yeah the uh, the bear Jew. Yes. Yeah. Um. Where it's, Tarantino. Yeah. Friends of friend of Tarantino. Where like I used to kind of appreciate his movies because like I I'm like oh you're doing this ironically and then like you watch interviews with him and you're just like oh no you're just a shitty person and I God hate damn it Max you're like amnesia has spread to me now yeah. I can't remember his fucking name either. Well, you'll look it up. Yeah. You're the one that forgot. You do the homework here. Um, but no, I, I understand that and, and I in very much agree. Although I'm not sure if I would like get annoyed to hang out in a room with Tarantino or like Eli or, Roth. Or, or, there or, yeah, 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 there you go. Um, or what would happen. But like I don't know. I feel like I wouldn't mind smoking weed with Tarantino. Like that but, As long as he was chill. Yeah. 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 Like that's the th- that's why weed. Like I wouldn't want to like go to a bar with him or something, but like if we could get like weed that would just like chill him out a bit and then just like talk about movies he likes, then sure, whatever. But he just seems <laughs> like Yeah, cuz I mean, he does have you know, a lot of good ideas um in, in his movies and I'm sure he has a lot of unmade movies that are also really great ideas. You know, he's a very uh, talented filmmaker. Um but, you know, his sensibility can become tiring when he's not, like you said, in complete control. Um, but also I think that's part of the advantage of this movie where I, I, you know, if Tarantino wanted to actually direct this movie, he, it would have ruined it because I think he would have tried to, to, uh, deliberately and intentionally inject that, like this movie's a shit exploitation movie idea into this, like he did in Grindhouse, which, I just find um, death proof to just be like boring. Yeah, because it's it's too deliberately it's too deliberately an affectation. It's like you could have just tried to make an exploitation movie, but instead you tried to make a fan movie of a exploitation and that's movie. Why There's I a like, difference, and that's why I like Planet Terror so much because like Planet Terror, besides from a few like flourishes where like the film burns out or whatever, and I'm like, okay, you're trying a little bit too hard. Yeah, but like. That movie feels like it could have been an exploitation movie. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Rodriguez more successfully um, embraced the process of like exploitation filmmaking. And I love like the fact because like the the poster and cover for that movie like prominently features the girl with the gun for a leg, and that doesn't come into play until like the last ten minutes of the <laughs> yeah. movie. Exactly how it would be in one of yeah. those fucking old movies. <laughs> and I mean, there is interesting stuff in Death Proof as well, but it's like you know. Uh, like, it's stuff that it's, again, it's an affectation. And what am I talking about with that? I'm talking about, like, you know, when you see the crazy stunts and everything, you you know in Death Proof it's just like, okay, so there's Zoe Bell, and she's a professional, extremely talented stunt person, and she's in no danger or anything on top of this car. But the movie's really, really trying to tell me that she is. You know, yeah. it's really trying to do that. And in doing so, it's sort of, it's not really communicating that it's just telling me how much it wants her to be in danger. But I know she isn't because at the end of the day, this is not a real exploitation movie. This is a fake one. This is a mimicking exploitation movie. 
And uh, I think part of this movie's um, strength is that it doesn't try to fully embrace that exploitation aesthetic. I think it mostly tries to uh, appropriate plot elements and then some light formal elements as well. I will say this, though, Max. As far as the script is concerned, like we said, this was something that Tarantino wrote, I want to say about like five or six years earlier, and he actually wrote it, I believe, for Greg Nicotero um, from KMB FX uh, because I think it was their story idea, and they hired Tarantino sort of on commission to to, to write this basically in a week. Before he exploded. To- yeah, because um, for anyone who doesn't know Tarantino, before he was really directing, he was writing movies, uh, and there's a number of pretty good movies that he worked on uh, as a screenwriter, stuff like uh, uh, Crimson Tide, for example. Really good movie. Uh, and then, of course, he wrote True Romance as well, so he worked with Tony Squat. Uh, Tony Scott. He worked with Tony Scott several times uh, before he uh, directed his own movies. But he wrote this for Greg Nicotero based on uh, their story idea from KMB. And um, from what I could tell from like his comments and Robert Rodriguez's comments when they were making this movie is that they had the opportunity to change quite a bit of that original script. But in the end, they they kind of decided to try to maintain a certain quality from that original script because they wanted to preserve an idea of amateurness, an idea of like trashiness that they thought was valuable to this genre and type of movie, which I agree with them with. I just don't think they necessarily necessarily succeeded. Um, I think the ending, but I, I appreciate their, that creative deliberation to do that where it's like, okay, we're going to try to make it a little bit cheesy, a little bit um, amateurish in some ways. And I think, I like that. I like that instinct to do that. I agree. And I think, although the movie falls short of that, I think it falls short in different ways in both parts, where the front part is a little too polished, a little too Tarantino dialogue-esque for it to feel exactly like that. And the second half, I I would more... It, that plays up the camp and that type of movie very well. Yeah. But... I, th- I would honestly say the special effects and props are a little bit too good. To <laughs> they are too good. Yeah. And you know what else is too good, frankly, Max? The acting. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> because that's the that's the real big thing, especially when we get to the second half of the movie and it's like we've got Tom Savini here and we got Fred Williamson. Um, you know, it's like, I mean, these... Like when Fred Williamson was in those original like black exploitation movies, it wasn't because he was Fred Williamson. Well, actually, maybe it was because he was Fred Williamson. It could very he well played be. in the NFL. I, I guess people could <laughs> know who he was. Um, but uh, my point is that, like, usually in exploitation movies of that type, you're not going to see like faces we know. And if it's faces we know, it's going to be in a sad Cameron Mitchell way, where they're drunk and they're not moving. Oh, Cameron Mitchell. And it makes you wonder if like the filmmakers just dug up their corpse and then just. <laughs> Sort of like gave it a jolt. <laughs> they just like looped audio from some of their previous movies to uh, get some original lines out of the actor. But um, that's not really what happens in this movie. It's a little bit too good <laughs> for that. Uh, which again is another way that I think Rodriguez really successfully reproduces the uh, exploitation movie in Planet Terror, where they're like, "Yeah, we got Bruce Willis," and then they're just like shooting the back of some random fucking person's head. Yeah. <laughs> for like a decent part of it. It's like some random bald guy (laughs) because you know what? They deliberately said, Hey Bruce, we only need you for one day. Exactly. And And it's like, was Bruce like, are you sure? Yeah. And like, (laughs) I mean, from what I understand, Bruce Willis is a fucking nightmare to work with. So maybe, maybe they had it planned originally to work longer and they're just like, "Uh, yeah, let's not do this. Actually, we're just going to shoot the back of your head. He's like, that's okay with me. It's a gag. Apparently, that's why they wrote him out of Expendables 3. <laughs> because he was just such a fucking nightmare to work with. <laughs> why does he keep acting? Let's bring him on the podcast. There was something where like, they were comparing uh, Bruce Willis to uh, Nicolas Cage in terms of their career paths. And how like they're both in like 80 bajillion shit movies every year. Yeah. But like for the most part, Nicolas Cage brings his... 100% all. To yeah, because Nicolas Cage can't turn off. Yes, where yeah. Bruce Willis is just like sleepwalking his way through every fucking movie he does because he doesn't care. Yeah. Um, 
to the point where like it wasn't Nicolas Cage in the middle of a divorce in Mandy. Yeah. So when he's like screaming, it's like right as his divorce is happening and it's pretty intense. I mean, that's pretty interesting in terms of like actor moment moments. That's like that, um, you know, really great moment in uh, Rosemary's Baby where uh, actually Mia Farrow got the call from uh, Frank Sinatra, like basically on set right before she did the take where she's crying to her friends um, because, you know, she's being gaslit and manipulated and isolated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Right before that take, she got the call from Frank Sinatra where Frank was like, hey, if you if you don't like quit this movie and then join me on my movie, I'm fucking divorcing you. And she basically hesitated and was like, no, I don't know if I want to do that. And she's like, well, I'm, he, he was just like, I'm divorcing you over the phone. That's what happened. So whenever an actor is able to really, you know. Channel that. Yeah, it's, it can be really powerful, you know. Um. So uh, yeah, I, I I don't think Bruce Willis channels <laughs> that type of authenticity really. Where I think Nick Cage is much more open to doing that and really can allow his emotions to come from a much more um, expressive place than Bruce Willis does right now. Maybe there was a maybe Bruce Willis would change his mind at some point if he worked on the right movie, but we'll see. Uh, but we talked over that moment, uh, the pretty uh, I I think frightening. Yeah. Moment where uh, Tarantino invites the bank teller woman to sit on the bed with him. And, and of course, take I think off it's her quite shoes. creepy. Yeah. <laughs> the shoes. Every moment, the shoes. Um, but what do you think about that tonal shift? Do you feel like it's kind of at home in this, no. in this exploitation movie? Or do you think do you think it was a good idea? Or what do you think about that? I don't know. Like, I know. And listen, I, I've been coming down hard on Tarantino. But like normally in his movies, when he like makes a cameo or plays a small role, I'm fine with it. I think it's fun. Um, even if he's not a particularly great actor, it's, it it is indulgent, but like, honestly, at that point, sure, you can do that. Whatever. But when you're the lead character for the first half of your, like you're one of the primary characters for the first half of your movie, you not being a great actor kind of brings that down. And then writing yourself into like these weird, despicable, creepy situations, like it just like makes me uncomfortable in a completely different way. Like I, I, I don't know. It's like a mixture of like I don't like his acting in this movie and the like radical schizophrenic tonal shift of psycho rapist murderer. Like doesn't play in well with like the rockabilly vampire rockabilly vampires or even like the tarantino-esque like back and forth witty criminals like yeah it, it's it's very tonally out of place in this movie and like i get it's supposed to raise the stakes of just like listen even though george clooney has rules about what he will do and whatnot it doesn't matter because his brother will fucking do whatever he yeah, wants yeah because his brother's like we do not rape people yeah it's like okay well that's great I no. guess it's too late for this woman, though. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I, I agree with part of that. I think, actually, though, that that, that moment is actually his most effective acting in the, in the film. I see him in that moment, and I genuinely get a chill down my spine. <laughs> um, I think that's just you picturing yourself if Tarantino asked you to come in to sit Come watch a movie him. with me. Yeah. Take off your shoes. If he asked me to do that, you know what I think I'd do? I think I'd prank him. I think I'd run up to him and I'd be like, got your nose (laughs) or something ridiculous that he could not prepare for just because that would be way more amusing. Also, you don't need Tarantino. You don't need to appease Tarantino to make your own movies in Hollywood. No. You could say, I'm going to fight you or something. I'd probably get you more publicity because you know, Tarantino's ego wouldn't allow him to. (laughs) (laughs) Publicly challenging Quentin Tarantino to a wrestling match. And that's the thing, though, where, like, you can read this as just like, oh, it's funny. He's writing himself as an awful person. Isn't that great? But, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, it's okay to do that as, like, a a joke. And it's okay to write characters that do fucking awful things. But, like, it's just a slight vibe of, like, maybe because it's Tarantino in general, where it's, like, I'm giving myself an excuse to live out these disgusting violent fantasies and film version and it's just sure but i also think 
I'm not saying it's not effective, but I, I'm saying I, I'm conflicted next. on how to feel about it. Let's pause. You know why? Because you know who's on screen right now. It's John Saxon. The dad from <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street. Or, you know, more accurately, John having sex. Son. It is so disgusting that he's not in this movie more. Yeah. He does just kind of show Actually, let's, let's redo this whole thing. John, John Saxon. Saxon. There we go. Just need to give him the proper introduction there. <laughs> And that was his entire scene in the movie. Uh, that sucks. That yeah. sucks so much. I love John Saxon. Rewatching this, I'd, I had kind of forgotten. I'm just like, oh, does he show up later? Is he like at the border or something? Oh, it's so nope. disappointing. That's his entire fucking thing in the movie. He should have shown up at the end. I mean, come on now. And also, he's exactly the type of actor that Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez would love to work with. You know? You know he's like their yeah. guy. John Saxon, what a fucking guy. I wish I could have made a movie with John Saxon. I don't think he ever really got like his due as an actor. He never really got like his really great, great masterpiece movie. I no. mean, he's been in a lot of great movies, right? But he's always been the reliable character actor. And I would have, I would have liked to see him, you know, be, you know, play like a grizzled old man. You know, he could have been a great old man actor. So uh, I don't know. I, I. I'm a big fan of John Saxon, and, and hopefully we can do some more of his movies going forward. Um, oh, man. Okay, so here we get the viscera for what we were talking about. But, Max, um, I want to float an idea by you. And I haven't thought through this entirely, but I think it's quite possible to look at this movie and uh, look at it as sort of like a bottle containing the two sort of conflicting creative instincts of Rodriguez and... Uh, um, Tarantino, where they're both similar, but they're both a little bit different. Yes. And uh, I, maybe you could look at this movie as a kind of like self-aware examination of Tarantino's uh, use of violence um, within like a media discourse, right? Because this has always been a talking point with Tarantino is this idea of gratuitous violence. I remember there's that famous interview of him in, uh, uh, what's, what's her face? Because it's so video. much fun, Karen. Yeah, well, who is he talking to from The View or whatever? Something like that, yeah. No, he's talking to... Uh, I think it's somebody from CNN or something. The woman from my alma mater. Oh, is it? Uh, What's her face? Rosie O'Donnell. He's talking to, like, Rosie O'Donnell, right? He's talking to somebody. Like, it's like a back and forth debate. Of, like, why do you have to put so much violence in your movie? Yeah. So, I don't know. I think there is maybe a way to look at this where it's like you have... You have the two Gecko brothers, right? And they're both kind of similar, but one is distinctly different from the other. And I think maybe there's a way to look at this movie where the violence is a type of bait for that, right? And and you're looking at, like, maybe this movie is like a discourse on violence. I don't think it, the movie really explores that super thoroughly because of the nature of the script and what they're going for. But I think there's a p possibility to read that into this if you were willing to do the subtextual work into really thinking about it, you know? Either way, I think the the fact of this movie being about these two criminal brothers and about this being kind of not a co-directing effort, but obviously Tarantino and Rodriguez, two big creative forces. Yes. You know, you're not going to get a script from Tarantino and then just like, what, X him out of this? No. Especially when he's also co-starring in the film. Exactly. So I, I do think there's maybe a way to look at it like that that kind of seems interesting to me. And we have to remember that I think that discourse on violence um, was really dramatic at this point in time as well. You know, I, I think I think the violence in media discourse really died down by the 2000s, by the yeah. aughts. I mean, well, it yeah. was still there, but watch R rated movies now. You can put fucking whatever you want. In them. Yeah. Like, I think we mostly missed out on on that because if yeah. we were teenagers in the 90s, I think it would have been quite different for us. Um in terms of the way people discuss and then like the discourse surrounding violence in media, I think it would have been quite different. Whereas like, <laughs> I honestly think that two thousands aughts discourse around violence and everything was a lot more of a, that was, that was <laughs> justifying it against uh, Brown people or whatever. No, I was going to say I had moved on to video games at that point. You had like the grand theft auto. Oh, I thought, scares. I thought video games was the nineties thing for sure. Like it was definitely into video games by the nineties. Well, like Doom with and everything. Mortal Kombat and Doom. Yeah. yeah. But the, when it really escalated was like grand theft auto and shit like that in the two thousands. So. 
Yeah, I uh, the ESRB kind of put a cap on it in the '90s when they're like, "Okay, we're going to create a rating systems board so that yeah, we can do this." But I think we can both agree that by the 2000s, culture was moving on. Yeah, from from that sort of particular fixation. And honestly, Max, I don't know if we've had a similar violence discourse thing since then. You know, obviously, school shootings have become in the last ten years major. Uh, a sort of discourse point uh, when we like the, our, how our culture thinks about violence and everything, but it it is not rotated and orbited around the idea of violent movies or violent video games in the same way that yeah. it did in the past. You'll you'll see it brought up every couple of school shootings, which is a terrible thing that you have to say as an American. Sure, but every every couple of but it's round, like who pays attention to it yeah. anymore? You know, but no, I'm saying like you'll hear it, but like yeah, it's not yeah. the driving force anymore. Now we have to sympathize with them and yeah, say how hard it is to be a young white male in this society and how the culture wars are really turning these men into killers. <laughs> First, it was Jordan Peterson. Then he bought a gun. <laughs> there was some image I saw. On the all-beef diet drove him crazy. <laughs> there was some image I saw on Twitter. It was like a Jordan Peterson video, but the video's title was The Cause of All Mental Illness dash Jordan Peterson. <laughs> so <laughs> I just looked like it, he was You know like, what, Max? I know it's so... I know it's so over to like laugh at Jordan Peterson, but it's so fun. I don't think I'm ever going to stop though. Cause yeah. it's just like, I can't believe you have a job, dude. <laughs> like how have you had a job for I so brought, long? I've been, uh, playing, I, I mentioned this to you, but I've been playing a lot of monster hunter with my uh, yes. friends online. Yes. And one of them lives in Canada mm -hmm. and me and one of my trans friends were just talking about Jordan Peterson, just like talking about how he's full of shit. And the Canadian friend, doesn't really have a foot in the race, like in terms of like the trans debate or whatnot, but just because he's such a prominent figure in Canada, the second we brought him, he's like, "Oh fuck, Jordan Peterson, piece of shit asshole." Is he a big and uh, he's a Canadian Canadian? He's a Canadian professor. Yeah, How but did they talk about him up there? Yeah, because his first big like political claim to fame was like uh, when the they were passing a law in Canada that was gonna like make it so people would have to legally recognize the pronouns that you selected. Okay. And he was saying how that would surely lead to Maoist dictatorship laws. Mao loved trans people. Yes. We know this. Historically, <laughs> Stalin and Mao, big on trans rights. Yeah. Hist that was that was Stalin's first thing. He's like, yeah. I am totally gay. Yes. That, it, it, it was a radio broadcast, famous. It, it wasn't like the uh, Lenin's Soviet Union was the first modern nation to legalize homosexuality and then Stalin fucking We can't talk about all this. That. We can't talk about this because then we're going to get bitter. Yes. We're going to get bitter. We're going to start insulting Stalin <laughs> and start calling him a bastard for killing Lenin. <laughs> <laughs> and the tankies will get mad at us, but... <laughs> well, I mean, the tankies should understand that we're really on their side. We're just saying that, like, you need to adjust who we're, we're like, you know, treating as the standard here. Lenin was our guy. It was not Stalin. Stalin was not the guy. Stalin killed our guy. This is what I'm talking about. This is why we can't talk about this. This is a different podcast than the vampires. Uh, the vampire titty bar podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I don't know how we got on Lennon, but uh, we were talking about Jordan Peterson. Yeah. How do we start talking about Jordan Peterson? Oh, violence discourse. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Well, I don't know. That was fun. I'm glad we went down that rabbit hole. Well, speak about violence, Max. Um, I think, I think the violence in this movie is quite significant in a way that, um, usually you're not going to find in as much from horror movies because in horror movies, violence doesn't tend to, especially exploitation horror movies, uh, it doesn't tend to have the same sort of significance for characters as it does in this other movie's generic predecessors, such as the Western. I mean, I think this movie is very, very explicitly, you could call it a neo-Western or a modern Western, right? But I think it's very much taking that uh, plot structure, especially for the first half, wouldn't you say, Max? Oh, yeah, a neo-Western, but yeah. like a Western, definitely. And I, I think we discussed this a little bit the other day where there, there are, can be interesting ways to blend the themes of Westerns with horror where 
a lot of the themes of especially older westerns are like this strong masculine person conquering the unknown and escaping from the burdens of civilization and horror you can easily blend that in with what if the unknown bites back but i don't i 50 50 on whether this movie accomplishes that or not well i mean the thing is westerns will have that component built into them as well only it won't it will come in the form of native americans yes there'll be this semi animal like force or or semi nature like force and you know there's a number of like really interesting genre crossroads here that i think we could connect to other movies we've done on the show but as far as looking at it as a western i i think um I think the interesting thing is talking about how like, you know, you can look at these characters representing a certain like moral order. I definitely think you could look at this movie, especially in this part where it's like this type of road movie. I mean, it's definitely uh, something that can harken back to a movie we've done on the show detour. Right. And if you recall to that episode, that's definitely, that's a definitive noir movie and what a great movie detour. Um, but it's a noir movie that co-ops and appropriates a lot of elements from the Western. Uh, and it uses the car and the journey westward and, and sort of how that builds on Manifest Destiny as a statement on like that idea of the American dream post-war in the 1940s. And I think this movie is kind of doing a similar thing. It's, it's similar to Detour in that way, where, again, I, I don't really know what the term would be, whether it's a neo-Western or... It's a, it's a Western in modern clothing, basically, but I think it's basically pulling the same trick. But in reference to uh, the othering of, you know, Native Americans or any sort of like natural force that would challenge our protagonists in the Westerns, um, I think you could easily compare this movie to uh, Pitch Black. Now, Max, I know I re- if I recall correctly, you're not the biggest fan of Pitch Black. To put it mildly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you will recall in that episode, one of the things we talked about is how that's kind of like a sci-fi western. Yeah, and uh, it it actually also shares another similarity to this movie, where what is Riddick? He's an escaped convict, just like these two brothers, right? So they they're traveling through their desert, except the only difference is it's on you know a desert planet, and then Keith David is there. Yeah, I was gonna say they they have a different religion for the religious figure that yeah. is accompanying them. Yep, um, and that's a trope of the Western is you're gonna have the religious figure, um, usually some sort of like patriarch, right? Uh, and then often they'll like rediscover their faith or something. That's definitely a, a Western archetype. Um, but uh, I I do think it's interesting to look at how all these different things intersect. And if you do compare this to Pitch Black, obviously the in terms of the horror element, the corollary is going to be the uh, whatever, whatever the fuck they call those alien creepers. What do they call them? Creepers and crawlers. What do they call those things? Um, neck bite, uh, neck snappers. Legion. Legion. We we were talking about Gamera earlier. Is that why you're bringing up Legion? Yes. Yeah, stay tuned for. <laughs> I would fucking love to do those Gamera movies. I've, I've told you, we're, I'm down. We'll do some turtle shit. Yeah. Um, We'll get a turtle in the studio I when think, we record that. I think I might rewatch one of those tonight. You've inspired me. Yeah, they're really fucking good. You also stopped by the archive earlier. Yeah. And you saw the like they had like so like the super sexy box set from Arrow. Yeah. And I'm just like, <laughs> I already own all of these on DVD. I can't justify <laughs> Max, you, what do you mean you can't justify? The special features alone has to be at least like 500 additional minutes of content. I know. You tell me those DVDs. Well, actually, Max, are those, are they the type of like early 2000s DVDs that randomly have like five commentary tracks on them? Because that was a thing. Some of them are. Some of them are the most bare bones ones. Honestly, so. those are the coolest DVDs to have. Yeah. Um, Because also it's like the type of thing where like a lot of people are like still like commentary tracks. What are this? these things, right? So like you get commentary tracks from like people who were like, doing craft services on the movie and they're just talking about their experience that shit is great uh we we did gloss over the part that like explicitly shows how like unstable tarantino's character is in the fact that like oh with juliet lewis saying like you want to munch him a pussy right yeah and because at the, at the beginning and I, i'm appreciating this more rewatching it for the third time in this week but Early on, during the gas station holdup, he's like, oh, well, 
he he mouthed hold yeah uh, help us to the cop and during the scene where he said that you can't see the gas station attendant's head you you can only see the back of his head you can't see his mouth so you don't know if he like you get the impression he's overly paranoid but you don't know if he actually saw that or not with that you're like oh he's just absolutely fucking insane and we can't trust him to do anything yeah i think that's a nice little escalation i'll give them that Although it's interesting how it does nothing to to increase any sort of pathos for him. No. You're still, <laughs> Maybe that has to do with his performance as well. Yeah, you're still happy to see him die later in the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Juliet Lewis, I do want to say that I think her character is kind of, or at least her performance is underrated. Yes. Her, her character is bare bones, Max. She is girl. Yeah, she she Max... She's definitely a girl. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, th- I think she does a fairly good job. Um, I think she does a really good job with her scenes with Harvey Keitel. Um, she certainly does much better than this stupid fuck in the, insulted, uh, in the Assault on Precinct 13 shirt. This kid's annoying, and I'm glad he gets torn into a thousand pieces. Uh, I, I don't think he's annoying. I think... He doesn't get a lot of time to shine because the movie knows that the daughter is going to be the one that survives the longest. But also look at this kid. They give her more focus. Max, are you telling me you wouldn't kill this kid if you saw them? Yes. All right. (laughs) Just want that on record. I would not kill this child (laughs) if I just ran into him on the street. Oh, man. My attempts to catch Max saying something incriminating have failed once again. You'll get me eventually. We'll try again next week. But... I, I think that's that's a little bit of a flaw in the screenwriting where like the movie already knows he's going to die. So it doesn't give him as much time to shine. And like, that's about as much character development as we get from him where he's like, no, we got to tell the cops. Well, I think the thing is that he's just not a good actor. And then they're having him like argue with Harvey Keitel, yeah. who is the best actor in this movie by far. Yeah. I'm not going to disagree with you there. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, I mean, maybe they're not putting him in a good a situation to win. You know, it's like, I don't like, if I was in this situation, I'm like, I would ask that, please don't make me argue with Harvey Keitel. I'm going to seem like a bitch. Yeah. And Harvey Keitel is like 95 right now. And if you put me in this situation, number one, Harvey Keitel would probably be in better shape than me. So he could probably still beat the shit out of me. (laughs) Number two, and audiences would be able to tell that. Number two, uh, Harvey Keitel would just have more conviction and uh, make it look effortless. So I don't know how, you know, as an actor, I would contend with that. But obviously, um, obviously, I think he's probably the weakest performance of the uh, bunch here. Who, Quentin Tarantino? No, the kid. Uh, Because at least Tarantino has a character, you know? I know. It's just a character I constantly want to punch in the face. (laughs) And you know what? The kid is not talented enough to, to just sort of wring water out of nothing, like Juliette Lewis. Who I do think does a really good job with this movie. It's kind of interesting to see Juliette Lewis do this movie at this point in her career because she was a very big up and coming actor at the time. She does she does do a great job. I yeah. know I was just I was just standing up for <laughs> the sun here, but you know, she does great in this movie. Yeah, she has a lot of moments where she's clearly trying to struggle to communicate with her father, the Harvey Keitel character, and she does a very good job at, um, I think, using her eyes to communicate exactly how much she's holding back when she's talking to him. Because everything she says on paper really comes across as kind of reserved and, and uh, you know, um, conservative in her relationship to her father, right? Um, except for the part where she says, you know, uh, oh, you said fuck God or whatever. Um, but it's it's clear that she's, She's dealing with her own. She ha- she's very good at establishing a sense of like interiority when it's not on the page. I think. Yeah. It's okay. Everybody's a creep, so it doesn't matter that Tarantino's also a creep. That was a very satisfying moment, especially rewatching it. I'm just like, oh, George Clooney does punch him out. Okay, that's nice. Finally. Ooh, we're in Mexico finally. 
Was that your Borat impression? Wow, wow, wee, wow. That was that. <laughs> yes, I, I, I love Borat's famous catchphrase. Woo wee, wow, wow, wee, wow. That's that's what everybody says after watching <laughs> Borat is woo wee. That that's what annoying people who missed the point of the movie always quoted was woo wee. No, nah. not my wife. Or very nice. It was woo wee. I mean, you have to admit that like the my wife thing was pretty good, even if you did understand the point of the movie. Yeah, he's just good at it. He said he's done with that, though. Just like his whole character. The Borat? J- just like that kind of... How the fuck is he going to get away with it? No, but you know? just in general, like that kind oh, of... Oh, really? Yeah. That I don't of... believe him. You no, know, because he almost got like fucking the shit kicked out of him when he did a routine like that at a Trump rally. And like... You know what? Sasha Baron Cohen, if you're listening to this somehow... Um, because you're a weird fucking person. I don't know what you do with your time. But let's say you are listening to this. Teach me. Teach me everything you do. I will do it. I'll take up your mantle. And I'll make you proud. I don't know. I'll do a good job. If he's going to teach it to anybody, I think it's the girl he act- acted alongside in Borat too. Because <laughs> she, they just picked her up somewhere randomly. And English is like her third language. Yeah, she's she, like from Bulgaria or something, right? And she was fucking amazing in that movie. Yeah, I didn't see Borat too, but... It, uh, it was fine. As somebody who didn't particularly like Borat 1 that much, it, I think it was better, but it was... Really? Yeah. But then again, it's very... like Also, like I, I saw Bruno, and Bruno was not <laughs> his finest work. No, it's not his finest work, and uh, I saw that movie in the theater with my dad. Same. Uh, my dad walked out of the theater. <laughs> so did mine. Yeah. It's not a dad-friendly movie. I don't think so. Two dad thumbs down. I will say, though, that that one moment in that movie where he approaches Harrison Ford yes. and then Harrison Ford immediately is like, get the fuck out of my face <laughs> is really funny. I know. I was dying laughing. Because you know for a fact that they didn't have to do any, like, that was truly guerrilla filmmaking where it's yeah. just like they're randomly, at, like, accosted Harrison Ford. And he's just like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Oh, man. Harrison Ford being mad in real life. I don't know why that seems so funny, <laughs> but it is. Well, imagine if he had to go to a Star Wars convention. <laughs> oh, 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 my God. Speaking of, oh, my God, we're introduced to... I, I'm sorry. I just I don't want to let that idea go the most... without commenting on it. Just Harrison Ford in the Star Wars convention. How funny that would be. This is definitely a real bar. This is this is a place you could really go. Yeah, and we were talking about this when we were preparing for this uh, episode where like this is another clear sign that this movie is just made by like absolute fucking nerds because when you look at the strip bar, the Titty Twister, there's lots of cool things here, but really the vibe I get from it is that it's like a rainforest cafe. Yeah, this it, is the rainforest cafe of strip clubs. It's overproduced. Like- yeah. Ever, it looks too grand and too fake to be like a truly like seedy weird bar that like a cartel leader would set up a meeting at. I mean, it's cool and fun, but again, it's why like like it's not so much an evaluation as much as it is like a description. It's like, yeah, this movie's made by nerds. Yeah, because we no, got the like, Rainforest Cafe strip club, and you referenced like Guillermo del Toro and Edgar Wright as like n- ner- like nerd filmmakers in yeah. the same vein. And we like both of them here. We've done yeah. we've done movies by them on the podcast. So like they're they're we like them. It's not a bad thing, but it is it is a style. But I just look at this and it reminds me of like Stu Leonard's as well. <laughs> like I feel like I'm gonna walk in and see like a singing cow on the stage it is wearing very, like a bikini and it just, is very corny. Yeah, it's just like Jesus Christ. Like, you know what else it looks like is a Chuck E. Cheese. You can see like an animatronic animal stripping for you. And that's not what I'm interested in. Just think it's like, yeah, it's like Chuck E. Cheese. (laughs) Yeah. An animatronic animal stripping for you. Yeah. Didn't you go to Chuck E. Cheese as a kid, Max? Uh, I did when I was very young and like I I was too young. I was like four or five. To understand that they were naked. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's what scarred me for the rest of my life. Yeah. We just talked over the best uh, monologue in the movie, by the way. Cheech Marine screaming about the different types of pussy they have. <laughs> that is the best line in the movie. 
I just love how in the in the neon signs they bother to have carnitas. <laughs> also, can, can we talk about how this is a bar in Mexico and everything's written in English? Well, I mean, clearly this is a tourist trap. I mean, Are you I, fucking kidding me, Max? This is like the Hard Rock Cafe. This yeah. is a tourist trap. But it doesn't help that 90% of the people in there are Mexican as well. <laughs> well, yeah, Max, it's it's Mexican run and Mexican operated, but they they suck in the tourists with their bright neon lights. Yeah, the families, as soon as they cross the border, they're just like, gotta go to the titty twister. It was the first thing on our tour guide. They do say it's just like, go down this road and it's to the left. So this is like immediately across the border. <laughs> <laughs> within within view of customs they're just yeah. like oh there's the tootie twister yeah donald trump showed this movie at his rallies yeah to to gain further fervor for his <laughs> border wall when mexico sends us people they're not sending us their best they're sending us vampires although honestly now that we're inside it it's like you want to create a wall between yourself and this yeah like i don't know this seems pretty okay you know what? This seems a lot better than some other bars I've been in. Everyone seems to be having a good time. Yeah. Until George Clooney comes in and fucks everything up. Everybody's having a grand old time. I mean, we know from watching the movie, they're all going to die later, but still. I mean, that guy who's getting punched in the face probably hasn't having a good time, but still. You don't know that, though. Hey, welcome to the podcast, Danny Trejo. Danny Trejo. Always happy to see you. One of our favorite guys. Yes, as we've mentioned before, recently uh, overtook Christopher Lee for the actor who has died the most times on screen. Um, well, I'll just wait until you start acting. That's only if you direct the movies, where I'll just die like 80,000 times in a single film. <laughs> You'll play like five different characters, and each one gets shot. So you know what's interesting about this scene uh, and the transition to the Titty Twister bar in general is that I, it's interesting how much it still is in com- completely in line with that sort of Western schematic, right? Um, where we transition from a, one type of Western film, the sort of stagecoach bound Western film where it's, it's more like a journey or a quest or a road movie. And then we, we come into this type of like one single location, movie right a western that's more um more derivative of uh the feeling of something like rio bravo right where it's like we're locked down we're in one place i mean the the sun is wearing that assault on precinct 13 t-shirt obviously assault on precinct 13 is a remake of rio bravo yeah uh as we know howard hawks is john carpenter's favorite filmmaker um so uh you know i i think it still works really well, that schematic uh, in this in this setting. The other thing we didn't bring up, though, is how the horror western is something that really started to come a- come about more in the American mainstream uh, during the late '80s and into the '90s. And I think the first big example is a movie called Near Dark, directed by Catherine Bigelow, and it's a Fantastic, wonderful vampire movie. Probably one of the best vampire movies of the 80s. And um, that one is really interesting in terms of how it uses the Western and like the idea of the road movie where uh, the vampires are constantly like slave to their physical limitations and their physical needs because they're vampires. And their Western sort of road movie journey is them basically moving from like one area and one victim to the next yes. right Speaking and of, uh sorry i just have to comment on tom savini because it's yeah, wonderful here to see is. him here playing a continuation of his character from a uh, <laughs> dawn of the dead he's dressed the exact same way hasn't changed outfits besides for the cod piece <laughs> well he might have had that cod piece the whole time you just didn't see it he didn't use it at all in, yeah in the zombie apocalypse we didn't have to yeah but it's it's great to have him here but yeah, basically with Near Dark, there's this interesting thing where that road movie thing and, and they're slave to their physical needs because they're vampires uh, creates this interesting thing where it's like the road journey, the manifest destiny journey uh, represented by the American West is something that's like completely stagnant and makes you completely immobile, 
which is interesting because they're constantly getting nowhere. They constantly have to feed. They constantly have to kill people to sustain themselves. So they end up in this infinite cycle of violence constantly headed westward, right? And it's kind of an interesting um, look at that type of movie. Um, but another movie that came out just one year before this, speaking of Assault on Precinct 13, is uh, the movie Vampires, directed by John Carpenter. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that one. I have, unfortunately. Not one of his best. But, but it does have one of the best lines in film history. Do you know what that line is? The line where James Wood is uh, antagonizing the priest, and he goes, a little boner for you, Father? A little, a little uh, morning wood there, huh? I'm going to give you a little boner? I don't know if that's exactly what he says, but it's, it's pretty close. close. It's close <laughs> and it's very him. funny. <laughs> a little boner, huh? A little boner, huh, Father? Gives you a little uh, stiff there, huh? <laughs> that, that, that line is so funny. I don't know why. Oh, man. I can't wait to ask a priest that question in real life. Hopefully over, not over something terrible, but, you know, whatever. Uh, we are about to get one of our father's character's best lines in the movie, or just dialogue scenes in the movie. But Harvey Keitel, you mean? Yes. Oh, that's a nice stripper. Just carries that lighter specifically for that. I mean, I get. I bet she would get really good. Uh, there we go. You know, tips. So uh, I think these are probably the two best performances in the movie, right? George Clooney and Harvey Keitel. And we yes. haven't talked too much about Harvey Keitel, but I think part of the thing that differentiates his character and his f performance from the rest of the uh, actors in this movie is how little of an affectation it feels. Um, I think all the other characters, particularly George Clooney, really feel like, you know, in the way they wield this Tarantino dialogue, it feels like an affectation. It feels like they're self, they're deliberately and self-consciously performing the type of character that they're supposed to be. The like smooth criminal type of character, right? Only the th part of the reason why I think George Clooney really excels in this movie too is because he makes that also part of the character where he plays it in such a way where it feels like, you know, this George Clooney character has to deliberately perform being a tough, smooth criminal to get by in his own life. Yeah. You know, and he makes it seem like a natural part of the character where he's constantly putting on this act of being the scary, tough guy. And I do, I do, I want to say that is something that we get from that really dark scene where, um, Quentin Tarantino kills the bank teller because I think it helps reveal that, you know, George Clooney is putting on that act, but he's not going out. He's not a brutal killer. He's no. not going out of his way to murder people for no reason. Right. He's a criminal. He yeah. Wants, he, he'll take money and he takes what he wants, but he, he doesn't necessarily like that violence. And you get that in the scene where Tarantino like you get the aftermath of it and it's just yeah. constantly flashing in front of his eyes. And he's like, what the fuck? Yeah. That's not his thing that he's about. Um, and again, I think that contrasts with the image that he tries to portray to other people to get what he's, what he wants. Cause he's constantly having to coerce people up to this point in this movie. And then it's interesting because we arrive at this setting where, you know, these vampires are going to come out and suddenly, you know, George Clooney is going to be in a situation where he needs to cooperate with other people and he can't really coerce them the same way, right? So it creates an interesting character situation. Um, and I think it's interesting the way it contrasts with Harvey Keitel, who, like I said, that performance doesn't feel like there's any affectation at all because I think Har Harvey Keitel as an actor makes everything look so effortless that it doesn't seem like he's trying, you know? 100% and I I love that scene because like you get he understands that it's a risky gambit but like to insult the man who's threatened to shoot them 80 million times but at that point he's so confident he's figured this guy out yeah yeah you know because you know what I think there's also a thing to it where Harvey Keitel is playing like you know a priest or a pastor or something like that right he he's able to play it in such a way where he's come across every type of person, which is part of why he's lost his faith, right? 
that he's there's there's no more like mystery for him in in terms of like how people work and he he probably arrived at a certain understanding of it and uh like you said it's pretty clear that he's figured out George Clooney and that's part of why he doesn't really feel like super intimidated by him uh he's played his part all he has to do is sit here yeah until dawn he's just waiting for his you know opportunity to get out whether that's just waiting it out or if he actually had to uh come into conflict with george clooney he would uh we get this very gratuitous scene where tarantino knows he's he's about to be killed so he's like okay but before i get killed in the movie i want to have some woman stick her foot in my mouth i would like salma hayek to uh have me drink beer off her foot now, this is an incredibly important uh, character moment for me. Uh, this needs to be in the script. Whenever anybody is just like, oh, Tarantino's foot fetish isn't that noticeable. <laughs> <The movies laughs> he's involved in, I'm just going to play this scene <laughs> over and over again. I mean, it was Salma Hayek doesn't really get to do anything in this movie. No. I mean, she does have a pretty famous, I, I would say, strip scene. Yeah. It's not like stripping, though. It's just I mean, moving she's, around She's sexually. probably the most memorable out of all the vampires, though, I would say. Well, she's the biggest spectacle. Yes. For sure. I mean, the movie grinds to a halt here, right? And it is a good spectacle, but also, like, it makes me doubt its intentions. I when I'm thinking Tarantino just put this in the movie because he knew his character was about to die. But what are you going to do? I'm, if people listen to this, they're going to come off being like, oh, this guy hates Quentin Tarantino. But no. It's just, like, uh, it's just easy to ding him sometimes. I hate him as a person. I appreciate his movies. <laughs> like, I, like I said, I would not want to, unless he was sufficiently stoned, I would not want to hang out with Quentin Tarantino. Yeah, I guess the thing to remember is that more so than people who make movies, I think... I can speak for both of us when we say that, like, we really enjoy movies. Yes. You know? And there are directors that I'm just like, I, like, if I could spend an entire fucking day with Guillermo del Toro and just have him show me around his fucking house with all the cool shit he has, cool. I would do that. He would never do that. I know. But I'm saying, like. You know what he would do instead? He challenging you to a wrestling competition. Okay. I think you don't understand how much of a bro... Guillermo is but I like it's apparently the first thing he did when he met James Cameron they started wrestling (laughs) throwing each other around which is kind of funny to think about (laughs) I hope he bruised James Cameron they were like at a party or something I think um (laughs) and they started wrestling okay Max I got a question for you yeah if uh if they hadn't kicked the shit out of that guy and then they didn't get into a fight right here. Would these dudes have turned into vampires? Yes. I think I think Yeah. I think so. Because we find later they have the entire storeroom of like truckers, cargo and whatnot, and we find out that's how they've been living for this entire time. So I think the whole gimmick of this bar is that they lure in like truckers who aren't gonna be missed. Right. They're bringing shit to Mexico and whatnot. And then later on, when everybody's too drunk to fucking fend for themselves, they all turn into vampires, kill them all, take their stuff, and repeat the process every night. So, I think so. I think they just expediated the process by being assholes. Yeah, that's certainly a possibility. I don't know how this bar, like, hasn't accidentally, like, gotten somebody, like, one trucker with... (laughs) <laughs> a family that deeply loves them and wants to follow up on their death. But Max, no truckers have families. We know that's this. true. Uh, but no, I I think there that's that's a viable thing to uh, believe. Certainly, uh, this movie deliberately looks at that idea, um, the idea of like truckers being a uh, vulnerable group of people, um, the outcasts. The people who would be in a sort of neo-Western movie, right? Because they're seeking to leave some sense of, like, restrictive civilization, okay. right? Yes, but we just got the transition, which leads me to want to talk about something that 
we've kind of neglected so far, which is the marketing of this movie. Okay. And the people's expectations. Going Whether or not they uh, were like, hey, it's a vampire movie. Yes. Um, from what I've seen, I looked up various trailers and I, I kind of scoured the internet seeing if I could find people's initial impressions of it. From what I understand, most of the original trailers were that terrible type of 90s trailer that just kind of gives away the entire fucking movie. And is like, here you go. This is the movie. Um, and it's fully narrated. Yeah. The, with the narrator doing like quippy comments. Oh my God, the cod piece comes into play right away. <laughs> there you go. Well, listen, they don't call it Chekhov's cod piece for no reason. Exactly. Yes. But there was a lot of people did go to it knowing it was a vampire movie, but there were a, a, a fairly sizable amount of people. That's my favorite prop in the movie, by the way. Like the just fucking corpse guitar. I yeah, love it. Pretty good. But there were a sizable amount of people who went in apparently having not seen the trailers or whatnot, expecting it to just be a Quentin Tarantino dialogue esque movie, like with these two brothers as criminals, and then were like, What the fuck is this bullshit when this started? So that I think I would love this movie if I had like managed to see it when it first came out in theaters with like people who didn't know what kind of movie this was. I think experiencing that in a group setting would be truly magical. Yeah. It's not merely that you don't know what type of movie it is, but it's like, you think it's one thing. Yeah. Is, is, and it's been going on yeah. this one way for so long and you think you see where the character paths are going to go and whatnot. And then this happens and you're like, Oh, Oh, okay. That's something. Juliet Lewis gets it immediately though. Killing Cheech Marine, his second character. Of the movie. Fun special effects. Yeah, I, I want to say the um, design and execution of the vampire special effects are quite good. Um, not only because I, you know, obviously they look quite good. Um, <laughs> this shit with Fred Williams is Ooh. funny, stabbing them on the table. Um, but I think um, they do a really good job of capturing that type of like cheap B movie vibe with their vampire designs you know it just works really well and also we do get like they're kind of like serpent-esque vampires they're snaky yeah which plays into the whole we'll we'll see later that like this entire bar is built on top of an aztec pyramid or but, some type of meso yes uh, meso-american yeah. society but um it, it kind of plays into that theme as well which i like Right. It's not just, oh, they're... That's how this movie becomes anti-colonialist. In the last 10 seconds of the film. <laughs> uh, no, I don't really think it's too anti-colonialist. But no. you know what, Max? That last 10 seconds of the film, that becomes a literal instance of everything we've been talking about with that monstrous idea of the Native Americans, right? Uh, I don't think we really finished our point from earlier, but like, you know, obviously in Pitch Black, what do we have representing that force of nature that our, our ambassadors of civilization are going to struggle against. Oh, it's the snappy monster things, <laughs> whatever the fuck they decide to call those things that I can't remember. Um, uh, but here we have the vampires. Then then it turns out, Oh, it's not they're They become metonymic. It's not a, it's not a metaphor that they're representing the native Americans. It's like, Oh, they are ostensibly the, this group of people in the titty twister, have been alive since fucking Cortez sailed over or whatever, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. So these, these people are like several hundred years old, at least. Welcome to slavery. No, thanks. I already had a wife. Waka waka. <laughs> oh man. That's what I talk about when I say this dialogue is just, whew. Oh boy. Not good. See, the first part of that was great, Max. I love the idea of a movie having a line that just says, welcome to slavery. Because that's just such a funny thing to say. But no thanks, I already had a wife. God damn. Yeah. Take that shit to the writing center, Quentin. There's certain lines in this that really I honestly hit mind, me in the wrong way. Yeah, but I honestly mind it less in the second half when it becomes like this stupid bloodbath and like we introduce scarred Vietnam war vet and a character named sex machine with a cod piece revolver. 
Yeah, but you know what though? Like, like <laughs> he just takes his heart out. I think I think Fred Williamson is fun in this. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's just the idea that it occurred to him to rip his heart out. He's like, yeah, I could probably pull this off. Um, but you know what? Um, I don't know, Max. It it goes back and forth for me. I just I don't. Re- you know what it is? It reminds me too much of the Joss Whedon soy dialogue. It just seems too similar. Um, and I don't know if we've talked a lot about that type of dialogue because I think I can speak for both of us when I say that it's terrible and it's grating and it's irritating and we don't like doing movies that include it, right? Um, that's why we're not going to do any Marvel movies because it's, it's irritating to fucking listen to. And, like, there's not much, like, I don't think we would, those would be good commentary tracks either. Yeah. But, I mean, just the dialogue alone, you know, that type of soy dialogue is, like, really irritating. And I, I, I do. Listen, I know what you're going for when you say soy dialogue, but, like, I, I don't want our listeners to be like, oh, they're, they're, they're against the fucking leftists. They understand <laughs> the al- our alpha Chad ways. Max, like, we've talked about how Lenin was the same. <laughs> But still, <laughs> but you know, I'll clarify when I'm talking about soy banter, what I'm talking about is lines like from Tony Stark or uh, uh, Spider-Man where he's like, now he's got a hammer. That's pretty cool. Or like, uh, I just got punched by an alien. Let's go for shawarma. After. Yeah, a, oh my God. It's like, I just got punched by an alien. I could really use some Greek food. I don't know about you guys, but I could use some Greek food. Just get the fuck out of here. It's very played out. It it's was, so fucking exhausting and over. Just and let it ha- just let it go. Listen, like I, I get it was popular, like it was a fun thing in AAA blockbuster movies, like at the time of the Avengers, but like it's been nearly a decade, guys. Can we fucking It's time to let it go. Yeah. It's time to stop with the soy banter. Because you know what the biggest problem with it is, Max? It's so fucking smug. You know? It's like, God, just get it the fuck out of here. I didn't mean for that to be a a whole tangent, but if we're going to have one soapbox item for this episode, I'm okay with it being soy banter. That can be yours. Get rid of soy banter. Mine's going to be how much I don't like Quentin Tarantino as a person. So We can both die on our own separate I feel like that's way more accepted, though. I mean, soy banter, there's a whole, like, class of Marvel people who think that's, like, the height of cleverness. There's also a whole set of film bros that would lick Quentin Tarantino's feet, much to his enjoyment. I don't think he would enjoy it. I think he needs to get, like, women, powerful women to lick his feet. Maybe Nancy Pelosi. We'll send them both off in a rocket ship. Someone, <laughs> what a duo! Nancy Pelosi and Quentin Tarantino. Now, Max, in the original draft of this movie, I don't know if you know this. What was about to happen was, you know, George Clooney's like, "You're not going to stab my brother. He may be a vampire, but he's still my brother." So instead, he. He decided to uh, take his pants down and blow them, and it turned into a porno. You you said this during our rehearsal. There's another genre shift. You said this during our like review, like rewatching of the movie yesterday, and I'm just like, I'm glad I got you got that out of your system, so you didn't need to say it in our actual commentary. <laughs> and here you are bringing it up it up again. I just think it's funny. It's not. But it okay. would be funny if they killed everyone, and then it just becomes an orgy movie. Because it's like, oh man, I just caught on to the fact this was a vampire movie. Now you're telling me it's a genre Len esque orgy in Mexico. You just what a twist! You find out John Waters was the third <laughs> creative mind behind this, and it turns into a weird incest. No, you would cast John Waters as the drug dealer that they were going to meet in yes. Mexico. He's like, yeah, I own this bar. <laughs> I would believe John Waters is a vampire. <laughs> no, he's too nice. He's too nice to be a vampire, Max. He'd be polite. <laughs> the 
thing is, like, he could only be a vampire later in life because I could see people definitely willingly giving him their blood. Oh, 100%. Uh, but that's only because of who he is. True. You but, know? but if John Waters walked up to me and was like, can I have a pint of your blood? I'd be like, sure, Mr. Waters. Honestly, please. yeah. <laughs> I would have no problem giving him a pint of my blood because, because whatever he's going to do with it is just fine. I'd assume it would be like a, something cool in a new Yeah, movie. can you imagine Jeff Bezos asking for your blood and how much more disturbing that would be? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Bezos, I'm assuming he's using it to like try to rejuvenate his youth and stay alive forever or something like that. Or, or he's like, going to make like a double of you to harass you. Or like put, yeah. clone me and put have a slave. And then fuck your ass. Your clone ass. And then when he gets bored of me, put me to work in the fulfillment warehouse. So. All right. I have a question for you. If you have a perfect clone and it's getting fucked in the ass by Jeff Bezos, are you getting fucked in the ass by Jeff Bezos? Well, that's like the question of would you fuck your own clone? No, it's not. Yeah, it is. No, it is not. Because, it's basically talking about whether or not, like... Because that's, the, like, the argument that I see some people use is, like, oh, well, then it's just masturbation, so it's it's fine. That's not true. We have we have. Different you think it's just masturbation if you fuck your own I clone? I think it's fine to fuck your own clone. I just think fucking your clone is just a fundamentally different activity than masturbation. I don't know who says that and thinks it's masturbation. Like, what are you talking about? Like, it's, like, it's just not the same. Okay. Well, I don't think we need to <laughs> keep going. <laughs> uh. This is like... Uh, you could have told me Tom Savini did a lot of the special effects in this movie, and I would have believed you. They they are great, and we do have some... I don't know. Dawn of the Dead. Tom Savini's stuff. effects are, are always very specific and special. I don't know if we've had an opportunity to talk about this on the podcast before, because I honestly think this is the first Tom Savini movie we've done or movie featuring him. Yeah. Uh, he, he's just an actor in this. I think he's a good actor when he wants to be, although I think he's just having fun in this movie, which, which is, is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I but, don't want more from a character named sex machine. I really don't. <laughs> he, he, yeah. He, he brought what he needed to for this movie. Um, we love Tom Savini, but the the really amazing thing about Tom Savini's special effects, um, for anyone who doesn't know, is that Tom Savini was a Vietnam veteran. And part of where he got basically his expertise in creating really effective gore was just using uh, reference from his time in Vietnam, where he was a, he was a photographer, right? And that was his way of kind of trying to sort of survive and distance himself from what was happening was through photography and he would often end up interacting with and photographing gore in his time in Vietnam. And that started to play an influence on him when he came back to the States and started doing it fake in, in, in movies. And, um, it's not only that he, he technically becomes very proficient at doing it as a special effects artist because he's very skilled at that. But when that happens, it becomes this very special thing that actually reminds me of our John Cocteau episode, Max, if yes. you'll recall that, where one of John Cocteau's really interesting filmmaking philosophies is this sort of net, like crossover between reality and artifice of filmmaking, where he's talking about like, you know, if you imbue your movie with real life, with something that's real, that when you watch the movie, there will be a magical after effect that shows up almost like seance photography. You know, and that's what I feel when I see Tom Savini's special effects. Is it's it's not just that it's like very technically proficient. It's, it's it's almost like seance photography because he's taking that journey through Vietnam with him into all of his work. You know, and it makes it weirdly powerful. That is to an me. amazing way to put it. Yeah. yeah, like, and that's why he's a very special person. I think in in horror film history, it's not just his technical proficiency and how many great movies he's worked on. It's that he has had that journey that he's brought with him to his creative work in a very unique way. Um, and I think it's made his work all the more impactful, you know? This is one of the most, at least quoted lines I hear from this movie. What I saw was fucking vamp. This is the line I see in the trailer yeah. where it's just ruining it right yes. in front of your eyes. But also, like, it, it's just funnier now. Like, the the more famous and more, like, 
prestigious actor that George Clooney has become, <laughs> yes. the funnier it is to watch him like load a pistol while talking about fucking vampires. You know what's funny is that uh, Robert Rodriguez and uh, Quentin Tarantino actually recorded a commentary track, I think in like 1998 or whatever, for this movie. And um, uh, I did not have the opportunity to listen to all of it, but it's funny when they talk about George Clooney because they were like, this was his big star-making movie, and now he's Batman. And it clearly the movie hasn't come out yet, and they're like <laughs> expecting him to be the next Batman for like several movies. It's funny. Oh god! But uh, <laughs> we did just get a Peter Cushing reference there. Yeah, those Hammer movies from Tom Savini himself, which was great. Yeah. You know, it sucks that uh, Quinn Tarantino never got to make like a movie with Peter Cushing. Or uh, Christopher Lee. Wouldn't that be fucking cool? Yeah. Yeah, I would have loved to have seen, you know, if not this movie, Tarantino's take on one of those Hammer movies. You know? I still would, honestly. I think Tarantino has always wanted to make a horror movie, but I think he is kind of hesitant because I think he understands, rightly, and I agree with him about this, I think he understands that horror... um is kind of the most ambitious genre for him to make. Because I think horror is the most central genre to his his idea of filmmaking aesthetic. Horror and then the Western shortly thereafter. I don't know. You'd have to hold it in a certain degree of reverence and like... I mean, the closest thing. I'm sorry, I was just pausing to appreciate him punching George, George Clooney getting in the face. punched. Yeah, the closest thing Tarantino has done to horror is in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where uh, they go to Spawn Ranch, and that's pretty good, honestly. That little bit where Brad Pitt is in Spawn Ranch and he goes talks and to uh, Bruce Dern. Uh, but I, I don't know. It's. It's something that I think if he was really passionate about, I think he would have done already. I mean, he's writing fucking scripts for Star Trek movies at this point. Like, Well, I, I mean, I think Tarantino is one of those guys who are like, there's a difference between the scripts he's writing and like the stuff that he's making and planning to make for himself. He probably has like a thousand ideas of things he would want to do. but although, he, I, although I never want it to be made, I, I do want to read his script for this. The Star Trek? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know... Uh, you know what it is, Max? I think Tarantino is very precious about his own filmmaking legacy. Yeah. And I don't think he wants to make a movie that is subpar, which, to be fair, that's a good in instinct. Like, you know, you don't want to make a movie that's bad. But I think the thing is, like, maybe it will it will make him focused and prioritized on, on, on like, certain things that he has in his mind compared to others. And maybe a horror movie just wouldn't be one of those because maybe he doesn't feel like the ideas that he has are like proper for that point in his career, you know? Uh, I think you think Tom Savini would have learned that like, if you get bitten by a monster, you don't hide that from the rest of the group. It never ends well. Well, I mean, Tom Savini does want to get like his head cut off by Fred Williamson. Yeah, true. <laughs> Speaking <laughs> of Tom Savini, I can only assume that this monologue they gave to Fred Williamson was meant for Tom Savini, and he was just like, fuck no. you. <laughs> yeah. My character's going to die. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm not saying your stupid Vietnam monologue. Yeah, Tom Savini seems very independent. I don't know if it would be easy to convince him. Because we get that weird cutaway to Tom Savini, right, that just happened, when Fred Williamson is like talking about like all my buddies. All my buddies in Vietnam, they got cut up by machine guns. I think that's why him and George Romero worked so well together. Was like, you know, George Romero, who's a very, like, efficient, like, we're just doing this, let's shoot it this way filmmaker. You know what it is? George Romero had the ability that I think Tarantino has always struggled with. Where Tarantino, I think he loves movies so much that he cannot help but talk about every single element of them. George Romero famously is the type of guy who's like, he's like, oh, uh, uh, Dwayne Jones, he, he's our lead for, uh, you know, Night of the Living Dead. Oh, uh, you know, it has nothing to do with the race. 
Yeah. You like George Romero says that. And you know it's not true, but George Romero, I think, is very focused and boots on the ground when he's making movies, like you said. And he's able to contain all those ideas within himself without like spilling his guts 100%. I think that's what you know Tarantino is not able to do. Because I think that that political potency of you know Tom Savini's work in stuff like Dawn of the Dead, I think Dawn of the Dead definitely relates to Vietnam, you yeah. know? Well, um, I think, and I, it's been pointed out before, but I think like his movies kind of got worse when he tried to play up that angle when he realized that people really liked the subtle social commentary that was in his movies, and he like entirely started making movies based around that. Like once he starts to really focus on stuff like that, it was to the detriment of his filmmaking. So I think it was good that his early career he could rein that in and just sort of make yeah. his movies. Yeah, he yeah. Um, but you know what? He definitely didn't make it let because when you watch those movies, it's like it's explicit. No, and it's, it, it's it, yeah, there. it's like on on the fucking nose. You know, it's not hiding behind anything. Um, but yeah, like Max, are you referring to um, uh, well, what's the one? God damn it, Land of the Dead. Yeah, Land of the Dead. I like though, to be honest. No, it's with not you. bad. Yeah, but it's it, it's. It's the next one I don't like, Diary of the Dead. Diary of the Dead was 100% just an old man talking about things he doesn't understand. But. Well, the problem with Diary of the Dead was like it was like it, it wasn't it wasn't even like a social thing that was happening. It was like the it found footage. Yeah, it was like a different technology and it was just like what, like, you know. Come on, sex machine. Tom Savini would get even more sex as a vampire. Yeah. Which is totally unfair because he doesn't need any. If we have any listeners who are really horny for Tom Savini right now. Hit us up. I mean, yes. <laughs> but also, uh, I would also encourage you to watch the 1981 George Romero film, Night Riders. Which, speaking of George Romero, what a fantastic movie. Yeah. One of George Romero's most underrated movies, Night Riders. So fucking good. Early performance for Ed Harris. A uh, really amazing performance from Tom Savini. And boy, oh boy, do they play up how sexy he is in that one. That's his whole thing, is that he's super sexy. He's like the Lancelot to Ed Harris's Ar- Arthur. Hard to remember which I did see they're just doing a, a 4K restoration of uh, Martin. It's coming out soon. Oh, Martin's so fucking good, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah George Romero is just so fucking good. God damn, George Romero has got to be one of the most underrated American directors. You well, know, it's because his movies, like, there's no directorial flourish in the movies whatsoever. I don't know if that's true, though. It's not that, you know what I think it is, Max? He was too successful with the one thing he did with Night of the Living Dead. True. And then he, you know what? He proved it wasn't a fluke. That was the real problem. It, it would be one thing to have one huge movie that was like an amazing hit. Like and then Night make of the movies Dead. like Land of the Dead and Diary of the yeah, Dead. Yeah, that's the problem. Well, he he made Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead. Which and are like, both fantastic. Yeah, and then it's like, oh, man, he's really good at zombies. And then no one paid attention to anything that didn't have zombies in it. You to know? be fair, Martin is weird. And like, if you try to tell yeah. people, like, go into it, it's like, oh, it's a vampire movie? But maybe he's not a vampire. Yeah. And maybe he's just really fucked up. <laughs> Maybe he's just Richard Ramirez. But it's also the uh, the main character that you're supposed to sympathize with is like he's also a serial rapist murderer. Yeah. And like it, it's okay. Don't, but don't, also like Season of the Witch yeah. is so fucking good. Season of the Witch is great. Um, we got to do that movie um, because that's in that awkward period for, you know, R- Romero between Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead. Uh, where, you know, some of the movies he was making, including Martin, were kind of just, like, out there and weird. Um, but, yeah, Season of the Witch is, is really great. Season of the Witch, a.k.a. Hungry Wives, both of which are fun titles. I would even say Monkey Shines. <laughs> it's a fun movie. I like Monkey Shines. That cover. No one's allowed to disagree with me. I like Monkey Shine. I mean, that cover fucking sticks out of my mind forever. <laughs> but I don't. I don't know about the movie itself. 
I'm just saying, in this world we live in, if I see Monkey Shines on, I'm g- in my like Rolodex of all movies of all time. And the ranking of them, it's like, this is like... Citizen Kane, Monkey Shines. (laughs) Monkey Shines is in the pack. You know, it's not at the bottom. Also, why do you think you're going to transform within the hour? Fucking sex machine in Vietnam vet transformed in 0.2 seconds. I mean, Fred Williamson transformed immediately. Yeah. Also, I just want to say, Fred Williamson's like vampire makeup is really amusing to me for some reason. I don't know what it is. It's like oh, the j- bottom half of his face is just completely. <laughs> it's open. just so funny when the like the bats start flying in, and yeah. then like Fred Williamson is like the king of the vampires. So <laughs> okay, you know what? I'm not gonna be nitpicky. I'm gonna assume it's because he's like a fucking priest or whatever. I mean, be nitpicky, but also when you're nitpicky, you're arriving at the point. The point yeah. is that it doesn't make sense. Yeah, and that's the way where they're imitating these uh, schlock movies, where it's like, yeah, that's pretty good. But as long as it's like Fred Williamson becoming the king of the vampires. Yeah. By the way, that's something I meant to bring up earlier about the K and B effects, where it's like they really do a good job of capturing the tone in their vampire design. You yeah. know? Like, um, you know, it would have been easy to make these vampires look, you know, uh pretty different, uh, you know, or or kind of like more serious, maybe. Um but not only are they able to differentiate it with the sort of Aztec snake element, but they're able to uh, make them look appropriately campy. And I think that's a very important element here. 100%. Now, Max, I think this whole like loading up scene, this action <laughs> Also, scene, I love how she just found a crossbow in like a vampire coffin thing. Like they just had that there. Yeah. <laughs> they had one of the truckers was transporting vampires. It was, it was a... Peter Cushing cosplay set <laughs> yes. that they had, and they just had a fully operational yeah, exactly. crossbow in a coffin. But Max, the one thing I want to bring up that's interesting about this scene is that they're what are they interacting with to to create their weapons? Stuff, stuff. But more specifically, what is it? It's coming from truckers who are hauling merchandise. Merchandise. It's like trinket capitalism, right? Yes. Um, being brought into this native land. Yeah, it's it's interesting if if you want to play with that subtext of colonialism and then the capitalism coming in as well, where it's like the the weapons they're appropriating to defend themselves, which by the way, very deliberately appropriated because none of the things that are using are actually designed as weapons, obviously, except for the crossbow. It is fun. I I feel like this sequence had had to have some influence. I don't know if you ever played a. Dead Rising 2, but like the big thing of that is just combining ordinary objects to make silly zombie killing weapons. And a lot of them feel like they were influenced by stuff in this scene. Well, I just mean that like, I think it's interesting to look at like the forces of capitalism as a weapon now. Yeah. That they're in, in like the, the commodities that they're using against again, what are native Americans? Yeah, but again, I don't really think that this movie picks up any sort of economic uh, or Marxist critique of the system that created this whole situation. You know, uh, thank you, son, for saying you're gonna kill me, Max. Actually, I like that moment though. I really do. You see George Clooney looking on him, just like he's a good dad. <laughs> for making his kids swear that he's going to kill them. I'm going to be a lapdog of Satan. It is nice, though. It should be the name of our fan club. It's going to be my next uh, new metal band. (laughs) Lapdogs of Satan. (laughs) You know what, Max? We're coming up on the end of this movie. And it's been it's been more of an enjoyable session than I thought it would be. After well, I I got to say I'm not enjoying it because uh, we haven't made enough titty twister jokes. And I was coming into this recording today, thinking like, oh man, we're gonna come up with so many good ones, so many jokes about titty twisters and purple nurples, but and not a single one. But it's a very small part of the movie, and we don't need to. Max, what are you talking about? They're inside the titty twister. Yes, which is a title we see. Twice in the movie. It doesn't matter. Oh, some bad 90s CGI there for a second, but it's fine. We get a lot of great costumes, a lot of great practical effects, and a lot of great deaths. Also, George Clooney, like, despite having the, the coolest looking weapon, probably has the least efficient one out of all of them. Yeah, honestly, his weapon sucks. 
I mean, I get it. Like, because you, you have to hit them in the heart. Number yeah. one, I get it. Like, you have this automatic staker, but like, yeah. He's fucking more effective. He can handle more vampires at once with like cross warding them off and then shooting them one by one. Yeah. And this then, kid has fucking holy water grenades and a holy water super. Spoiler. Yeah. The idea that they didn't just go with the sun's weapon. Yeah. All of them is pretty crazy. Um, Cause again, I don't know. How, does Juliet Lewis have like training with a crossbow? Is she good with her aim? Apparently. Yeah. I, I wouldn't trust myself with aiming anything. So I would just go for the, uh, the water gun here. Yeah. You don't really need to aim. You can just shoot everywhere. And if one drop touches them, they catch on fire. Is it possible to have holy water? That's like beer. Could they like just break, break the, um, the drought from the bar? Well, isn't wine the blood of Jesus? Can't they, can't they just fucking. Well, okay. But that's specific wine. I think the, the incantation, <laughs> Whatever the fuck they have to do to make the wine, the blood of Jesus is a little bit more in depth than holy water. But you th- I'm just saying that you think they would have more. Uh, I guess there was a tap in the back. But I'm saying this is a bar. You think, oh, my God. Thing from Dead Alive suddenly s- snuck into the movie. What the fuck? He's a <laughs> werewolf or a were rat. something. Looks like a rat. Yeah, he's a were rat. Sumatran rat monkey. Yep. <laughs> Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry. This is the second week in a row I've brought up Dead Alive. I don't know why I have it on the brain. I mean, it is really fun that they're just like, yeah, he's going to be a rat monkey for no reason. It's, it's Tom Savini. We'll make him the most in-depth prop yeah. we have in the movie. You know, this is where the movie reclaims some of that exploitation stuff um, more genuinely because it's like, yeah, it really does make no sense that he's a rat monkey. Yeah. Now. Who cares? Also, why this girl who was hesitating to stake people earlier because she felt bad. She's a fucking badass with a crossbow now. Fuck you. You know what would be more fun and I think more appropriate for an exploitation movie is if they did the bullshit uh, Lost World thing where, like, she kills Fred Williamson by, through gymnastics. You remember that? <laughs> yes. That was so funny. I can't believe Jeff Goldblum's daughter killed those Velociraptors with gymnastics. <laughs> Steven, what were you thinking? I still get people who look at me weird when I say Jurassic Park 3 is an objectively better movie than The Lost World. But Is that... Who can debate that at all? I don't know. Spielberg fanboys? I'm just like... I don't know. That movie's so bad. <laughs> Lost World is just not a good movie. Lost World is not a good movie. And uh, Jurassic Park 3? Amazing dinosaur effects. Yeah. And like, yes, it's it's basically the, the first movie again. Oh my God, Max. We are bringing up Jurassic Park 3 and now I have to say something really crazy and weird. In the 1981 version of Clash of the Titans, there's a specific sound effect that was designed for Medusa's tail that is like a rattling noise, right? Uh, You can go back and you can listen to it, listeners. You can Google it right now. And then if you go back and watch Jurassic Park 3, that same exact rattling noise sound effect is used as like an echo chirp for the raptors and i noticed this last year and i cannot figure out why the fuck that is a cheeky reference i mean a lot of people who worked on that movie must be like super into practical effects and yeah stuff. and clash of the day but also it's like why that fe- why that effect why is it medusa's thing you Rep- know reptiles um, maybe max maybe but Max, it is the same exact sound effect. No, I, I, I will show you after. You. Yeah, I completely understand that. Would be oh amazing. man, this kid's getting ripped apart. I love this. I have a feeling that was something that like the special effects department like snuck in, just being like, this. Uh, "You know, Robert, I think we should uh, rip this kid apart." No, well, that <laughs> that applies to what I'm saying too. I was just talking about your Jurassic Park thing, where like the oh okay, the yeah. special effects team was like, "Oh, let's put this in as a cute little reference. We'll get nobody else will notice." And then a decade later, and then uh, then weirdos who watch too many movies notice, and it drives them to like killing themselves because they don't understand. Now they're gonna get sued for a million dollars because they didn't have the right to use that sound bite. And did they have the right? I don't know. I don't know who produced um, Clash of the Titans or who who holds the rights now. Yeah, who did the shitty? Did shitty you remake? see the original 1981 Clash of the Titans? Of course it's I have. Not bad. It's not bad. Yeah, of course I have. It's no Jason in the Argonauts. True. Which let me tell you, listeners, I don't want to let you behind the curtain too much, but that's been on our list a long time. We have a lot of movies. In our I would list. love to do that fucking Jason the Argonauts movie. Oh, my God. Those with those fucking skeletons. That was I a- mean, I know everyone talks about it, but goddamn, yeah. they're so good. 
that was formative for me. That's like one of the movies that got me into special effects in general. It was like a key thing for movies for me. I remember watching that movie <laughs> when I was a kid and in my uh in my house growing up, uh there was this really amazing like playroom basement area that we would watch I would watch movies in with my friends. And um it had this big open window to the pond right in our backyard. And basically every time there was a special effects scene, I would be watching the movie, and then the moment there wasn't, it would be back to the pond, looking at the pond, looking at the uh, crane in the pond. (laughs) I love that the Cheech Marine character is not even going to open the door. They're just like, hey, is anyone in there? (laughs) Seems like some shit's going on in there. This scene reminds me. I love me how of they the, just shoot the door down. They don't know what's going on, but they're like, "Oh, he said kick in the door. Let's fucking blast it open with shotguns." Yeah, this scene reminds me of the end of uh, the V. Yeah, kind of. If only that student had had a uh, disco ball to paralyze all the demons. Speaking of the V, one we've done a commentary track on that, which you guys should all go and listen. Which to. I think we did a fairly good job on that one. Yes. Um, also, Arrow, very mysterious movie. Yes. Also, Arrow just released a new Blu-ray. Of the V. That's right. You picked it up at the archive, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, if you if you live in the Connecticut area, go to the archive and pick it up. They're great. Yeah. But otherwise, fucking just just pick it up in general because it's definitely worth it. it yeah. A bunch v, of bonus features. The V it. is like a we. It's the only Soviet horror movie ever made, which should interest you if you're a horror movie fan to begin with. Um, but aside from that, it is a genuinely mysterious movie because. I, I we just don't have access to a lot of the information about its production. <laughs> I don't think or it's very hard to find. Um and it was a very widely seen movie when it was released because it was seen by so many people in the Soviet Union and yet it was not released outside of the Soviet Union so it's been kind of an oddity in the West since then. But in reality it's I mean it's got to be one of the most mo- watched horror movies ever, right? Yeah. It was a huge thing in the Soviet Union. So um yeah, the an v, important piece of film history that yeah, you might have missed out on. And it's like a lot of people don't appreciate how much of an important piece it is. The V is a really big, special movie. You guys got to go check out that movie. If you've reached this point in the commentary track and you're a fan of From Dust Till Dawn, you're going to love The V. I did see on the back of uh, the box, the person who did the special effects for that was considered to be like... They could, they called him the Ray Harryhausen of the Soviet Union. And yeah, the Ray Harryhausen of the Walt Disney. We talked about that in our episode. Yeah, but they, even the Arrow release agrees with us. So yeah, I like to think we uh, inspired Arrow. That yes. one. Go. They totally did not know about that movie until we <laughs> did an episode on it. I'm sure it's definitely not an important piece of film history that they <laughs> that planned. They were for fully for aware of. <laughs> And as long as we're talking about the V, one more thing about it. You can go watch that right now because I still think the rights are kind of up in the air. I don't know if it's public domain or what the deal is, but you can find it on YouTube. It's not a really great updated version, but that's the version we use to record our commentary track. So it's, you know, if you're if you're strapped for cash or you're, you don't live near Bridgeport, Connecticut, <laughs> near the archive uh, and, and some place where you can get the Arrow edition, you can go find it on YouTube. A drug dealer friend of mine. That was something that was said in the movie. Max isn't just having a stroke. I mean, I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, Max, if you were in this situation, your dad and your brother were killed. Okay. Let me get in this mindset. Okay. Would you go off with George Clooney? No. What would you do? You're also in Mexico. Yeah, I don't know what this girl's plan is. Like, George Clooney, like, acts like he's like, I, I'm not going to sully her life more by taking her with me. Where it's like, I understand that, but also it's like, let's take a little bit of responsibility here. Yeah, um, she has a mobile home that I don't even know if she knows how to drive. Um, She has to get back across the border when... Covered in blood. Covered in blood. I mean, I'm assuming she can take a shower and change in the mobile home, but still... She has to get back across the border when that vehicle is registered as having gone across the border with three people 
with the stated purpose of vacation. Now they're coming back with only one. And the border is already on high alert. I, I don't know what the fuck. And she has a bunch of illegal cash on her now. I don't know what the fuck's going to happen to that girl. It's not going to be good. It's not enough cash to justify Sorry, your, 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 your brother and dad exploding as vampires. Yeah. But we're, we're rolling up on the end of the movie here. Um, I, I'm not going to lie. Yesterday, I was kind of skeptical on how it'd be feeling throughout this entire movie because I, I was kind of bummed out it wasn't as good as I remember. But it's been a fun commentary track, and I am glad we talked about it. I really am. Yeah, I, uh, I find it to be a really interesting sort of moment for this type of movies and horror movies. And uh, I think it's very much of its time, you know, like that's part of what really interests me about it. Um, and I, I also agree that it's interesting to uh, compare this to the grindhouse stuff that both Robert Rodriguez and uh, Quentin Tarantino would do later in their career. And um, I feel like we haven't discussed really Robert Rodriguez's directorial style or, you know, much about his career specifically, but we're definitely going to do other movies. I was going to say, we're in revisiting. His career, yeah. Um, but I, I, I think it's, it's clear that Robert Rodriguez, much like Quentin Tarantino, although in his own specific way, has really managed to uh, appropriate and utilize a lot of those exploitation elements to really great success throughout his entire career. Um, he's really made a name for himself for doing stuff like that and then also branching off into, again, more... Um, sort of novel cinematic experiments with stuff like spy kids and then shark boy and lava girl for better or for worse. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Robert Rodriguez is always a director that I'm, you know, fairly interested in seeing what they're going to do really. Um, because I know that, you know, when it, when it comes down to it, Robert Rodriguez is, is someone who's not afraid to experiment and they don't have a huge ego about what they're making. Yes, which is... Which is really nice because it frees them to be as creative as they want. Which means that we'll definitely yeah. revisit them later on the Spectator Film Podcast. And if you want to be around to listen to that episode... You get want your titties to, twisted. Yes. Get that out one more time before the episode's <laughs> over. But if you want to be around for us to talk about Robert Rodriguez or many other directors' films, be sure to check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, stitcher and wherever else you can get your podcasts we started uploading to youtube if you prefer to listen to your podcasts there check us out on spectatorfilmpodcast.com austin any closing comments titty twister no i, I don't really have